video will take you through the structure and function of the cell membrane. To begin this activity, I'm actually going to ask you to do something uh, here in the classroom. Uh, hopefully there are some balloons of different colors scattered around the room. What I'd like you to do is to take a moment and pick up a balloon and smell it. And then record the odor of this balloon in uh, either in your journal or on a whiteboard. Make sure that you have a chance to smell each of the balloons of each color. Uh, when you're finished, go ahead and compare the results to the results of the people at your table or even at a table next to you. And then discuss the following questions with the people at your table. How do you think that the smell gets out of the balloon? And hopefully you were able to smell something. And then hopefully you were also able to see a brown fluid on the inside of the balloon. Why do you think that the fluid does not leak out of the balloon? Uh, so go ahead and pause the video now and complete the activity. And when you're finished, um, come back and press play. If we're thinking about the cell membrane, what I want you to begin to appreciate is that cells, like any living organism, have to maintain homeostasis between what's going on inside of the cell and what's going on outside of the cell. So this dynamic balance ultimately has to be regulated, and it will be the job of the cell membrane to at least in one way, shape, or form uh, regulate what's going on inside the cell versus what's going on outside of the cell. So how does the cell membrane do this? Well, if we think of the cell membrane like a bouncer or a doorman at your party, obviously when you're hosting a party, there are certain people that you want to invite and you want to come in, and there are certain people that you'd rather not come in uh, to your party. The cell membrane is behaving in the same basic way. It allows some things to get into the cell. Uh, it also allows some things to get out of the cell, but for the most part, it's preventing certain molecules from getting into the cell or certain molecules from getting out of the cell. It's acting as the doorman. It's acting as the bouncer. It ultimately decides what can get in and what cannot. So we refer to the membrane as being selectively permeable because it only allows certain molecules to cross. So again, on a whiteboard or in your journal, what I'd like you to do is to make a list of materials. These materials would be molecules, try to be specific, that you think would need <coughs> to get into the cell or would need to get out of the cell. Uh, when you're finished, compare your list to a list written by your neighbor and discuss any differences that you have between the two lists. So again, pause the video now and go ahead and make your list. Well, here's a very generic list that I came up with. Uh, molecules that would need to be able to get into the cell would include uh, most biological molecules, sugars, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids. Uh, O2 is going to, be, is going to be, need to be able to get in, because of course all cells perform cell respiration. Waste is going to have to get out, and one form of waste that might need to get out is carbon dioxide. Water is actually going to need to be able to get into the cell and get out of the cell. So those are all molecules that you would expect to need to get in or out of the cell. So what does this cell membrane actually look like? What is it composed of? Let's go ahead and begin to build a model of the cell membrane at your tables. Uh, hopefully at your table you have a Ziploc bag that has some styrofoam balls and some wooden sticks in it. What I'd like you to do is to use that styrofoam ball to represent the phosphate head of a phospholipid molecule. The phospholipid is the principal building block of the cell membrane. So use the ball as the phosphate head and use the sticks, the wooden splints, to represent the two fatty acid tails of the molecule. Hopefully you remember from your reading that glycerol will serve as the molecular backbone that holds all these parts together. So go, once again, go ahead and use the parts at your table to build a phospholipid molecule. Pause the video and then press play again when you're ready to continue. Did you come up with a structure that, look, that looks something like this? Hopefully your phosphate head is the styrofoam ball and the two wooden splints make up the fatty acid tails at the base of that phosphate head. This would be a cartoon version, of course, of a phospholipid, but it does a pretty good job representing the, the principal parts of that phospholipid molecule. The image on the right is obviously much more complex, but isn't that drastically different when you think about it. Here's the phosphate head, and here are the fatty acid tails. Okay? If we were to look at a space filling model, we have the same general idea. We have the phosphate head, here's glycerol, that's the part of the molecule that holds everything together, and here, of course, are the fatty acid tails. Notice in these illustrations that the fatty acid tails actually are coming in two different forms. We have one 
that is saturated, no carbon-carbon double bonds, and one that is unsaturated. You can see the one carbon-carbon double bond right there. So in general, a false lipid is composed of a phosphate head and two fatty acid tails. Those fatty acid tails may be saturated, they may be unsaturated, they could even be polyunsaturated in some cases, and glycerol holds the, the molecule together. Well, what do we know about the phospholipid molecule structure? Well, we already know the parts that will make up the phospholipid. But when we think about the cell membrane, and we think about the cell membrane really just being composed principally of these phospholipid molecules, what we want to begin to understand is how the chemical properties of these phospholipids will contribute to the overall structure of the cell membrane. Well, if we look at the phosphate part, sorry, if we look at the phosphate part of the phospholipid, it shouldn't surprise you that the phosphate part of that phospholipid is polar. Um, if we look at the structure, we have oxygen atoms, we have phosphorus atoms, there's going to be an unequal sharing of electrons across that molecule, and the phosphate will be polar. Contrast that with these fatty acid tails. The fatty acid tails are composed of carbon and hydrogen atoms. We know that carbon and hydrogen atoms are held together by nonpolar bonds. So that means the fatty acid chains are nonpolar, while this phosphate head is polar. And that matters to us because when we, when we begin to think about how the phospholipid will give rise to the membrane, we would expect that the polar part of the phospholipid would face water, because of course water is also polar, while the fatty acid tails would try to get as far away from water as they possibly could because they're nonpolar or hydrophobic. So let's see if we can use this information to build a model of the cell membrane. In that Ziploc bag at your table, you're going to find some cotton swabs. They kind of look like cotton swabs that have been cut in half, and along with some red pieces of cut-up straw. What I'd like you to do is see if you can use those cotton swabs to build a cell membrane. Think of the cottony pot part of the cotton swab as the phosphate head of the phospholipid, and the stick part of the cotton swab as the fatty acid tails. How do you think these molecules will orient themselves, will arrange themselves to build a cell membrane if there's water on the outside and inside of the cell. Remember, the cytosol is mostly water, so we can assume that the inside of the cell would be polar, just like the outside of the cell would be polar as well. So again, pause the video and see if you can use what you know and use the parts in front of you to build a model of the cell membrane. So what did you build? Did you build a molecule that looks something like this, heads, the phosphate heads, to face water on the outside of the cell? and the polar heads to face water on the inside of the cell, where the cytosol is located. The nonpolar hydrophobic tails, they want to be as far away from water as they possibly can. So they orient themselves into an arrangement where they're as far away from water as they possibly can. Well, if you built this model correctly, what you've done is you've built the cell membrane as a bilayer. And this is important because all cell membranes are composed of two layers of phospholipids, an outer layer that faces water, and an inner layer that faces water. The outer layer is hydrophilic, the inner layer is hydrophilic, the internal region in the middle is hydrophobic. So what do we end up with? We end up with a structure where the hydrophilic phosphate heads face water and the hydrophobic tails face the inside of the membrane. So with this in mind, what we want to begin to think about is if there is a hydrophobic interior to the cell membrane, we can see that here, what does that mean for the types of molecules that might be able to cross the membrane? Well, if you remember, polar likes polar and nonpolar likes nonpolar, but polar definitely does not like nonpolar. So if we begin to appreciate this, all cell membranes have a nonpolar or a hydrophobic interior while the outer surfaces of the membrane are hydrophilic. So take a moment and think about some of the molecules that you think would be able to cross the membrane freely. Uh, and also think about molecules that you think would not be able to cross the membrane. Make a list of those molecules on a whiteboard or in your journal. Um, pause the video now to do that, and when you're ready, go ahead and press play. So what'd you come up with? Well, hopefully you came up with the, the idea that polar molecules are going to have a very hard time crossing the membrane because polar molecules will not be able to dissolve in that hydrophobic interior of the membrane. 
Non-polar molecules won't have as much of a problem because they'll be able to dissolve in that hydrophobic interior. So the rules like dissolves like or polar dissolves polar are really important to us because that membrane will act as a semi-permeable barrier by allowing some molecules in, most of the non-polar molecules, while keeping the non-polar sorry, while keeping the polar molecules out uh, out of the cell. Of course, many of the molecules that you drew earlier um, are polar. The carbohydrates, the amino acids, um, the nucleic acids, those are all polar molecules. So later on, we'll discuss the, the idea that because cells need those molecules, there still has to be a way for those molecules to cross the membrane, and they're going to need to get some assistance to be able to do that. Okay, so we're making progress. Now we have a model of the cell membrane. The membrane is mostly composed of phospholipids. We have a sense of how those phospholipids are oriented in a water environment. And we have a sense of which molecules should be able to cross the membrane and which molecules will not be able to cross the membrane. So now we can appreciate the selective permeability of the membrane as a whole. What we haven't looked at yet is the idea that the membrane is not solely composed of phospholipid molecules. It's actually composed of different types of molecules that are all mixed together to form the membrane. We call the membrane a fluid mosaic because of these different components that make up the membrane as a whole. Well, what is a mosaic? I'd be willing to bet that at some point you've made a mosaic in art class. Maybe you took different pieces. Uh, maybe you used uh, mixed media. Maybe you used the same media and you put those pieces together to make a larger form of artwork. Um, the cell membrane is behaving in a similar way. We're going to use multiple types of molecules, put them together into a mixture, and use that mixture to give rise to the cell membrane. Well, what makes up this, uh, this mosaic? Along with the phospholipids, we're also going to find proteins and cholesterol molecules. And these molecules will be floating in between the phospholipids. Some of the phospholipids and proteins are actually going to have carbohydrate loops attached to them, and the, many of the proteins that we uh, are going to have in our membrane will be involved in the movement of materials from one side of the membrane to the other. So go back to the model of the membrane that you made with the cotton swabs. Think of those red straws. What might those red straws be doing as part of the cell membrane? Well, ideally, they're going to be responsible for transporting molecules into and out of the cell. So here we have a picture. Whoops. Here, we have a picture of the cell membrane. Sorry about that. There we go. So here we have our picture of the cell membrane, and we can see pretty clearly the phospholipid bilayer highlighted up here. We can see the protein molecules. Think of them as red straws. The only part that you don't have in the model at your table are these carbohydrate chains that may be attached to either the proteins or to the phospholipids. Okay? So now we have a sense of what the membrane is composed of as a whole. It's phospholipids, it's proteins, it's carbohydrates. Um, all together will make up the overall structure of the membrane. All right, one last piece that I want you to be familiar with. If you remember on the previous slide, we refer to the cell membrane as a fluid mosaic. It's not just a combination of different molecules. All of these molecules are floating around, um, and they're bumping into one another, just like you'd expect molecules to do so to do in any fluid. Let's take a look at what this actually looks like within the cell membrane. So this is a cartoon version of the cell membrane. Here we can see our phospholipids pretty clearly. We can see our proteins pretty clearly. And we can see these carbohydrate groups that are attached to, in this example, one of the proteins. Let's turn the animation on and watch what happens. You can see that all these molecules are moving and wiggling, just like you'd expect a fluid to move if all the molecules were in constant motion. One more time. So along with the membrane being a mosaic, 
We can also classify the molecule as a fluid because all the molecules are moving and bumping into each other. All right. So why does this matter to us? Well, because the membrane is fluid, we can do some pretty remarkable things. One of the things that we can do is actually inject cells into other cells. And what I want to show you is a video of that process in action. So what you're looking at here is a glass pipette. Okay, a pen up here. There's a glass pipette. And what that glass pipette is being used to do is to pick up an individual sperm cell. So you can hopefully you can see that inside of the pipette. Moving up and down. This is an egg cell, this large round cell. On the left is what's known as a holding pipette. It applies just a little bit of suction to the cell to hold it in place. Now watch what's going to happen. The egg cell membrane is being pierced with that glass pipette that you saw a few seconds ago. Because the membrane is fluid, because all those molecules can move, it's, fu it's fully possible for this glass pipette to <coughs> pierce the membrane and then to inject that sperm cell, here it comes, hopefully you can see it, right into the egg cell. When that glass pipette is pulled out, because those molecules that make up the membrane are fluid, they'll come back together, they'll seal the membrane, and they'll prevent anything from leaking out. Imagine if this wasn't the case. Imagine if the membrane was a solid structure rather than a fluid structure. As soon as we begin to try to, try to pierce that membrane with our pipette, the membrane would crack, it would fracture, and everything on the inside of the cell would leak out, everything on the outside of the cell would leak in, and ultimately the cell would die, because it would lose that ability to maintain selective permeability between the inside and outside of the cell. So, obviously, the, the notion that the membrane is fluid is very, very important, and we can see that happening uh, in the video here on the screen. All right, so the last piece of the puzzle is a little bit of review. Uh, this is a good time to stop the video and think about the questions that appear on the screen. Can you answer number one? Can you answer number two? Can you answer number three? Can you answer number four? I encourage you to write your answers on a whiteboard or to write your answers on, in your journal so that you have a record of those answers before you move on to the next activity in class today. I hope this video was helpful, and as always, if you have any questions regarding what we do in class or what we, uh, what we see on the video, please come in.